So today we want to we wanna talk a bit about how do we handle unexpected tragedies and dramas, right? Life is full of tragedy, life is full of drama, life is full of issues. And that we say they're unexpected because they're just that. We don't expect them when they show up. What is a tragedy, right? A tragedy is an event that causes great suffering, destruction, distress. That's a key word there, such as a serious accident. Hey, did we just have a serious accident a few days ago? Michael Peely was in a serious accident. That's a tragedy. Did it cause a distress? A whole lot, right? Is it causing a family a lot of distress? It's a whole lot. How do we deal with these things, right? Um, here are some synonyms, a disaster, calamity, catastrophe, right? All of these, misfortunes, mishap, these are things that we can't always um, you know, predict. Afflictions and tragedy and, and adversities. Christian, we understand that in the spiritual, right? We always say we're afflicted, we want deliverance and the like, okay? Next, what is a drama? A drama is an unexpected series of events or a set of circumstances. You guys see that on TV all the time, right? We have drama, all these films, you have different drama because the drama is unfolding, right? Something is going on normal and then all of a sudden you see, bam, bam, this happened, this happened, and it seems like it keeps you on edge for the rest of the thing. Well, that's how life can be as well. Some synonyms for that, an incident, a crisis, disturbance, right? A commotion or turmoil. We say the world is in turmoil. In other words, the world is experiencing drama. That's why we call the cosmic conflict, right? What is a conflict? It's the same thing. It's the cosmic battle that is taking place or the cosmic drama. So spiritually, we are all in a drama, John. We are all in a drama. And how do we survive the dramas of life? How many of you know your own self, right? I normally say, but I keep hearing people say you either in a drama, heading towards a drama, or you're just getting out of drama. So in other words, it's never just like simply all peaches and cream or a bed of roses as we know. But that's what life is all about. So let's look at the story that we find ourselves in 1 Samuel chapter 30. This is a, oh, distress. What is distress? Distress is, means extreme anxiety or sorrow or pain. Can you imagine that? So now you understand when Paul says he's in distress. And when we will look at, in just a moment, when it says David was in distress, he was not just in, and, and this was even to another degree, Sister Martha, because the passage is going to tell us that David was not just in distress, Sister Rodriguez. It says he was greatly distressed. So that amplifies it. So in other words, distress by itself is extreme sorrow and pain. What else? Anguish, suffering, agony, torment. Right? All these other things. You are in misery, woe, and sadness. Right? Now we understand even depression can be a form of distress. So these are some of the kind of things that are going on in people's life. And sometimes that's why I want us to become more practical. You know me. We talk about many different things. But I am a practical Christian. And so when somebody is in distress, yes, all we do, brother, I'll pray for you. Man, I'm in distress. You tell me you're just going to pray for me. I need you to do something about my situation. Don't just tell me you're going to pray for me. Praying works, and we should do it every time. But that's one of the problems I have with church folk. We just pray about everything, and it ain't solving nothing, right? We got to go beyond praying. Praying is the, is the starting point, but then what did your God tell you to do now that you pray, Right? We don't do the action part. So we have faith, but no works be backing it up. So we call that a meager or weak faith. In the last days, you can't just say you're just praying about everything. I'm praying about it, praying about it, praying about it. And then you get up every day, you go to work, you get up every day, you do these things. That's your practical life. It's the same in the spiritual. But we get into the spiritual and we just pray everything away. And it doesn't go anywhere. That's why problems look at us like, who are you talking to? Right? Who are you? You're not little Jesus. You're not big Paul. I'm, not, I'm looking at all these things. I'm like, what's going on? The problems are saying, God is saying, listen, when you were in Egypt, I answered your prayers like that. Do you notice how God treated the Israelites differently? When they were in Egypt, they cried out to God for liberation. And what did he do? He came and he, li he liberated them. Did they have to do anything for that? No. He took care of Pharaoh all on his own. Right? All they had to do was cry out. Right? Pharaoh coming to them in the desert, bam, God came down. God stopped all of that. They came up to the Red Sea, nowhere to go, bam, Moses, just hold up your rod, bam, he take them all through. Because Moses was the one connected to God. They didn't, they didn't have nothing to do with God, right? Once they got over into the wilderness, notice the shift now that was taking place. 
They cried out to God, I'm going to send manna, but who's going to pick it up? You better go ahead and pick it up, and these are the instructions that you're going to do. And so in the desert, he's coaching them. That's why now he said, you know what? I can't just have you guys just relying on me for everything. Let me give you some laws, some guidelines, some principles, that if you live by them, it's going to be well with you. By the time now they got over Jordan, he had already changed entirely how he's dealing with them. Many of us are still in Egyptian way of thinking that God is just going to do everything. We can call that when you just come to faith, you notice God part everything. I need a job, it just shows up. I need my rent paid, it just shows up. And we think that that's how it really works. No, God is helping your immature faith. He's giving you some stuff, but it doesn't always work like that. When the Israelites got over the Jordan, now he says, guess what? You're going to drive out all these nations. But Patty, who's going to do it? He didn't do it. He says, you got to fight. That's why I took 40 years to train you how to fight. Because I know what was coming. And you're going to think that I'm just going to come down from heaven and fight your battles for you. He says, no, I will be with you. But you got to have to raise your hand to do the fighting. And Christians don't like that. We are lazy Christians. And that's why the man said, yeah, Christians are very superstitious. We are. We're not spiritual. We're superstitious people. Because we think it's just spooky thing and we wonder why God is not answering our prayers. God is answering your prayers. But he said, you done prayed, you ask. Then he says, seek. You didn't do no seeking. And then after the seeking, he said, you might need to knock also. Three steps. But we just do one step. We just want to pray. We ask him. And then we wait. No, you got to do something. So let's look at this story here real quick. We know and understand that uh, when David was, was trying to get to the throne, God had already spoken concerning um, David being the, the king of Israel. But then we noticed that him and Saul, they had some, some contention, right? David was running from Saul for most of his life, pretty much, until he became king. And then the Bible tells us that twice, David had the opportunity to kill King Saul, but he spared his life. Are we there? Remember the story? And then we got down to 27, chapter 28, 29. Now we see that... Uh, the Philistines, they are coming now to attack the kingdom of Israel. And so what happened is King Saul decides that he's going to go confront a witch. See, that's what we do to us Christians. God is not answering our prayers, and then we go and try all these other things. Because we're not getting no answer from God, so we say, I'm going to take it into my own hands, right? And so we start doing things to answer our own prayers that are unbiblical. Because we are desperate. But we didn't follow what God was telling us to do. It wasn't God's fault that King Saul couldn't hear from him. King Saul started deviating. And he wasn't living by God's code, God's principles. So now he's trying to take matters into his own hands. He already said a law, by the way, that you shouldn't even, you know, that was known throughout Israel. And furthermore, he's the king. So he said, no witches and all of that. That's his own law. And now he's going against his own law. And right after that now is where we get the story developing because David had to flee from his own country. Have you feel, felt like that sometimes? Our young people are fleeing from the Adventist church to find refuge in other people's camps. That's what David, David kept running. David couldn't have peace with his own people. So David was on the move. He was on the run with his few men. And so sometimes our own people have to find refuge elsewhere. But let me tell when you find refuge in other people's camps, sometimes you're going to boot hairs with the camp you came from. That's why folks can spot an Adventist, even some of these Adventist young people trying to look cool in other camps. You stand out like a sore thumb. Everybody's trying to do stuff on Sabbath, but you, you, you're trying to make up an excuse, but they know that, hey, you know what, something's wrong with you because we, we don't have any issue with it. The fact that you have to think about it means, hmm, you're probably from a different camp. You're trying to fit in our camp, but I, I see there's something different about you, Right? And so this is what was happening with David, because David now is with the, the king, King Achish. And so his men is saying, listen, we know that David is a strong warrior. David is good. David is powerful. But if we go up against Israel, chances are he might fight for his own people, because that's where he came from. Amen? And so we have to now be careful the same way, right? And so here's the thing now. So now the battle is, is kind of going on. So King Achish said, listen, we're on the battlefield, David. You need to go back. At this point, David had gotten some property, so a place to live from King Achish, and he gave him the, um, a place called Ziklag. So now let's pick it up real quick. 30, chapter 30 of 1 Samuel. And it came to pass 
when David and his men, if you read uh, 20, the ending of 29, you'll kind of get it. Well, let's go back up to 29 real quick. Okay, so King Achish now is telling David, here's what he says. Wherefore, um, now rise up early in the morning with thy master's servants that are come in with thee. And as soon as ye be up early in the morning and have light, then depart. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning and return to the land of Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. That's where they went to fight the battle. Chapter 30 now, verse 1 again. And it came to pass that when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag, and they burned it with fire. Now here's the interesting thing. You remember the Amalekites? The Amalekites, when Israel was being freed out of bondage in Exodus chapter 17, the Amalekites came out and attacked them. And God wasn't pleased with that. If you read Deuteronomy, there were several people God was talking about. You know what? Unto the tenth generation, let them not worship with my people. Some of them didn't treat them right. Some of them, and so God has his own ways. We will look at that and say, that was not fair. Look at God. God, God wasn't tolerant. Listen, God has his own ways, and I can't speak for him. You will have to take that up with him. So that's why you should get to heaven. Don't miss out in heaven. All the questions you have that the pastors and the church can't answer, you can ask them to God himself. So that's another reason. Get, get yourself saved, be in the kingdom of God, then you can ask him directly. Use that when you're witnessing. How about that? <laughs> okay. Now, verse 2. And they had taken the women and the captives that were therein. They slew them not. No, this is good, right? So we will call this, they were soft targets, right? Churches and schools, these are soft targets, right? So we, we, we're just going to rough them up a little bit, get their spouses angry. So, verse 3, so David and his men were come to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters that were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him, oh, this, look, look, look at the emotion and the response now that's taking place. So David and his men, what did they do? When they beheld this, they lifted up their voice and they wept. But how did they weep? They wept until they couldn't weep anymore. Wow. That is deep distress. That is like a terrorist moment. We left our wives and children here in a secure place, and someone has come and taken them. And of course, they take, they're thinking the worst. We would all think the worst, right? If your children are being kidnapped, how would you feel? Think about that. But that's what's happening all over the world. Many children are being kidnapped. Women are being kidnapped. We have... Uh, trafficking, human trafficking, sex trafficking, all kind of stuff that is going on in our world today. Our world is becoming more and more sinful. And it's grievous unto God's people. So David is experiencing deep grief with his men because all their family are now taken from them. And in this situation, we find ourselves, and sometimes that's what I'm saying, Christians, it's okay to weep when you are in a crisis. Weep if you must. Jesus wept, didn't he? Jesus wept. So when you are facing tragedy, that is one possible response. Is that we should weep about it. Cry about it. And be okay with it. You know, I know sometimes we do pretend like, you know, let's play tough and so forth. But even the toughest of us cry at times. I don't have a problem with macho guys. Because I know in the silence... In the stillness of the night, that's when we cry. That's when we cry. Because everybody does cry. You know? I don't like my wife seeing me. The only natural place I cry is over spiritual things. You know, sometimes you're sharing a testimony, your heart is hit. And I'm like, Lord, how is it that you cry so easy for these things? But, you know, other things, it's like you try not to be so emotional. You know what I mean? Woman, I just said it's going to be all right. You know? <laughs> but you, you, you're burning inside. And then at nighttime, boy, <laughs> Lord... I don't know what to do, Lord. Please provide an answer. Sometimes when you cry, it actually makes it better. And so if you are bottling up the fact that you are angry, you can actually be suppressing emotion that needs to get out. And then you vent it on the wrong people. Isn't it so? So if you got to cry, cry to get it out. Here's a verse for you. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, 
verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. And the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Amen? So if you have to weep, let people weep. Don't try to just tell them everything is going to be all right. If my man lo lost my kids, if I lo lose my son right now, I'm going to be upset. Oh, pastor, the Lord works all things to together for good. I don't want to hear that. I lost my son. Tell me all things work together for good. Well, in this case, let God make it good. I need my son back. We have to be entering into the people's suffering. I think if we are silent some more and try to enter into the people's suffering, then we can sympathize with them more. Because God is not offended with this thing. God already knew. And God knows what's going on. So don't feel like you have to, like in this case, we're trying to defend God. You know, I know sometimes we need to do that, defend the doctrine, defend the faith. But do you know that you don't need to defend God? God defends himself. How is it that if God is the lion of the tribe of Judah, hear us, little chihuahuas, trying to defend the lion. Now look at that situation. You have a big old roaring lion in the jungle, and you have this little puppy going, rah, 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 trying to, no, come on. That's really what it's like when you say, well, I'm trying to defend God. Listen, you can't defend God. God defends himself. God is trying to defend you and me. He's the fortress. He's the rock. And we have to go to him. So let people in the midst of their tragedies and sufferings and pain, let them cry. And I encourage many of us because I see many of us, we are sick, we, have, we are going to the hospital, and one of the things I notice, especially with us Adventist people, which touches my heart, but in a, in, in a negative way, because we are taking on more guilt and shame and condemnation because we now are just having self-inflicted wounds. What do we mean by that, Norma? Something happens, and now we use these terminologies that Maybe the preacher has given to us, the church folks have given to us, like God meant it for good, or God causes this, or God is using this to test you. God is using this to grow you up. God is using this to mature you. You don't know the mind of God, and everything that happens to us is not of God. So when you say that, you are taking on yourself the prerogative that you don't even know what, what is happening here. Look at Job's situation. Did Job cause all of that? No, he did not. And so we must not attribute all forms of violence and all these different things that are happening in distress. Like we said, tragedy is an unexpected event. You didn't plan for that like I sit down and orchestrate. Well, some people might be loony like that, orchestrate your own demise. No. And it's not necessarily that it could be. But don't jump to that conclusion. Because I'm telling you, as we go in the last days, we know it's going to get more and more difficult. The Bible is not, when Jesus said, for example, you will suffer persecution, is he causing the persecution? No, he's prophesying. But it doesn't mean that God sends you persecution so he can make us well. Sometimes we have that attitude thinking, you know, God has to send this, God has to send tribulation our way so we can become righteous. God, you remember the story of uh, when Abraham, you know, Abraham, you know, with the, the rich man and Lazarus situation. He said, listen, even if somebody raised from the dead, they're still not going to hear. So sometimes you think, yeah, God is doing all these things to get our attention, and you think that God has to go to the extreme over there. To, listen, even that sometimes doesn't get our attention. Because God will deliver, and then we go right back to the same old thing. But be careful. Be very careful. Because, again, we are told in the Acts of the Apostles that in the last days, the Holy Spirit of God will be being poured out on the hearts of people. But those who cannot discern it, you know what's going to happen? They will attribute the works of God for the devil and the works of the devil for God. And that's a very, very dangerous position to be in. Didn't the Pharisees do that? This man, the works that he's doing is of Beelzebub. <laughs> I'm like, why? This is the... This is the Son of God, and look at what they're saying about it. But here's comfort to know that Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, we know this one well. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. For the child of God, in the midst of tragedy, drama, trials, know that your God can deliver you, and that God can indeed make good out of it. But doesn't mean that he caused it. Are we all there? 
So you have to weep because weeping is good for the soul. Weeping gets it out there. Right? Your parents are, are, are elderly. Yes, sometimes it's going to cause you to want to weep. That's okay, my sister. Matter of fact, it is encouraged. It is encouraged. What is the next thing that happened here? Here now the table turns. David's two wives were taken captive. Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, um, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. And David was greatly what everybody. Remember we, we gave the definition of distress? Extreme sorrow. But in other words, it's like saying if you add greatly in front of it, it means he was greatly, extremely, abundantly in distress and pain and sorrow and agony. Woo, that's difficult. For the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved and every man for his sons and his daughter. Listen, this is kind of what I was alluding to there. I should have clicked on this um, stuff. So in other words now, the men are blaming who? David for the tragedy. So that's what happened. When you're in tragedy, one, you're blaming yourself and other people can blame you. Now, like I said, it, listen, yes, John, in many ways, we can contribute to our own problems and dramas, okay? That is self-evident. But I think in the Christian church, that is the natural response to say, it's because of some sin that I did why this is happening. And I want to fix that today because I know in our community, we have a lot of people who are suffering from health conditions, and this is the kind of foolishness that we throw upon them. You want practicing a vegetarian lifestyle, that's why you like this. Really? Like seriously? I am in pain and suffering and that's the first thing you want to tell me. Wow. Wow. Could it be? Yes. But is that the only reason why people get sick? We've already established that. We live in a sin-sick world. And yes, we practice and do the best we can do, but it does not immune us from tragedy, from problems. That's like saying, you know, it's the same thing. Your husband or wife leaves you. Listen, yeah, there's some things out there to contribute, but I can't control what another person does. So how come we don't make the same application? Because in one place we say, oh, you weren't living right over here, so this is why this happened. I go to the job, and they say, today you're laid off. Is it because of some sin I did because I'm laid off? The business wasn't doing well. And the boss man is saying, I got to cut back. So therefore, I'm laying off people. Because Christians are going to be laid off and non-Christians are going to be laid off. They didn't just simply, let me target all the Christian people and let's just lay them off. Sometimes they do that, but that's not generally how it works. So the reality is, because of sin, listen to me closely. Because of sin, every last one of us is subject to everything, not everything, but most things that the world will suffer from. The fact that we live in this world, we will be victims of crime. The fact that we live in this world, we will be robbed. The fact that we live in this world, we will be, you know, people will steal from us, people will do all kind of malign us, they will do, you know, destroy our reputation, they will do all of that simply because you live in this world. And it has nothing to do with the fact that simply because you may have done this thing wrong or this thing. Listen, then Jesus already said, if you live right, you can expect this to happen to you. Was it good things? No, bad things. <laughs> First Peter chapter 4, we read it a few weeks ago. If you suffer for righteousness, what does that mean? You're suffering unjustly. Did you deserve that? No, you didn't deserve that. But the fact that you are in this world, sometimes you can be doing everything right and evil still comes upon you. So do not cause more suffering and pain. And be very careful, brothers and sisters, when we do that. I call that miserable comforters are we, just like Job. We teach beforehand, we don't want you to do this. But when the situation occurs, Sister Wani, guess what happens? It's a new reality. See, I like to deal with reality. In other words, we teach our children, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. All right? But when they have done it now, it's no sense just, you know, 
yeah, you chastise them for a bit, but you're not going to solve everything by reminding them what they didn't do. Now it's time for restoration and starting over. You follow me? So the reality is I don't want you to go down this path. Right? I don't want you to get sick. But now that you are sick, I need to deal with you as a sick person. Because this is a new reality. So let's solve the problem. Right? So God is the same way. He says, if you sin, he says, I don't want you to sin. It's not the will of God that we sin. But he says, if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's just before he said, by the way, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar. In other words, you're already just sin right there. So he's just acknowledging, listen, all of us will sin, but he's saying this is the solution. So it means, therefore, that God deals with us to restore us. He already knows all of us are going to fall short of the glory. Some of us are falling big and some of us are falling short in our own estimation. So we think that because we fall short in this way and they're big over here, they're worse than us. Listen, these are really, really some things that are hurting us. But I'm saying, guys, one of the reasons why sometimes people say, you know, I don't find love among the brethren is because of these things. We have to be balanced in our theology. You lift up Christ always to those who are righteous and to those who are unrighteous. When we fall short, we need Jesus because that is what is going to heal us. That's what's going to make us better. So yes, brother and sister, we fail, but you know what? God loves you. Give them hope. Help to restore them. Because now is not the time. I was with you. Here's the thing. I was with you. And now you're telling me that I'm the reason why we lost our families. How could that be? And that's why even sometimes these things, I, I, like I said, I, 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 I foreplay these things in my mind. Because sometimes even when you go on mission trips, I'm like, Lord, you go on a mission trip. If something happens, well, they might say, oh, well, it's the pastor who invited. And if, if, if he didn't invite them, then they would have been okay. So you role play all of these things. And that's why you need insurance and all this stuff today. Because that's one part of the problem. And it's not easy. <laughs> you, you, you get me, Sister Sonia. So it's not always easy. So sometimes you want to invite people, and I'm like, well, I, I don't know, because if something goes wrong, and then you do. People call me for financial advice. I say, brother, listen, I can't give you financial advice, because if I do give you and you meet with misfortune, the first thing you're going to say is, the pastor, <laughs> the pastor told me this. All right? So one lady did that. I mean, you know, when the cryptocurrency rate stuff was going there, she said, Pastor, I see you interviewing people and stuff like that. I said, listen, sister, listen, that's the expert. You go to them. But I can't tell you nothing on that. But do you, hey, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm not even telling you what I do because if you do what I do, it doesn't mean you're going to get the same results. All right? So let's be very careful on that. And lastly, this is the thing. But the Bible says here, though, interestingly, even though David was going through all of this, what was his response? He says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. In the Lord. This is what I love right here. It didn't say the men encouraged him. It didn't say anybody else encouraged him. Now he's going to call for the, for, the, for, the, for the guy who's doing the priestly work. But it didn't say the pastor or the priest encouraged David. Because he could have called for the priest to do the uh, encouragement. But David, no, the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. What do we mean? If you have several translations, it will also say, David found strength in the Lord. David bolstered himself in the Lord. In other words, he dig down deep and he said, this is where I take my stand. You can call me this all you want, but all I know is God still has a plan and purpose for me. Yes, I may not be doing well financially today, but praise God that he's going to supply all my needs. Yes, I might have gotten sick. But you know what? I believe that God can still restore me even if the church people kick me out. We need to have that type of attitude. So some people don't leave the church on account of people treating you certain ways. What you do is you dig in deep and you say, yes, God, these people, they don't understand your ways. But I'm telling you, God, if you are for me, nobody can be against me, including church people. God wants us sometimes, John, we have to encourage ourselves because nobody else will. The best person to encourage yourself is you. Because you understand your situation. That's why I encourage people, if you're in distress, yes, call for others to pray for you, but let God hear from you. 
Because you can cry out for you like nobody else can cry out. Encourage yourself. This is seen all throughout the Bible, by the way. People need encouragement. Leaders need encouragement. Everyone get depressed and discouraged. Notice when Joshua was taking up the, uh, the mantle, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 8, this is of, of Moses now, command Joshua and encourage him, strengthen him, for he will go over before these people and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. So here's the thing, Joshua needed encouragement. He needed outside encouragement, but here's what Judges tells us now. When God's people are going into battle, the Bible says, the men of Israel, Judges chapter 20, verse 22, the men of Israel encouraged themselves. And they went out again and they formed the battle line at the place where they had put themselves in array the first day. In other words, they had lost that first battle. They lost the battle. But Chris, the Bible says, they went out again. They, they got a whooping. By the way, they were being obedient. God told them to go fight. And they went and fight, and they lost, Brother Griffith. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? I'm following God. I'm certain that he said to do this thing. And now that I've done it, I'm meeting loss. That's why you got to see through spiritual eyes. Because our defeat is apparent defeat in our own eyes. But God does not. God cannot be defeated. So when you are defeated, that's a setback. Somebody says setback is a setup for a comeback. I don't know, but that sounds good. That sounds good. When you fall, if you can land on your back, Les Brown says, then you can look up. Because guess what? Who's up? God is up. So yes, you might fall down. But when you're falling down, turn around. Don't land on your face. Land on your back. Because on your back, you say, look up. I will lift up mine eyes onto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from Jehovah. And if you can look up and ask Jehovah God to help you, then you can turn around any and every situation. Because in the midst of your suffering, God can deliver you from, but he can deliver you in, and he can even keep you there and still use you in a powerful way. So all situations, and that's how we understand now that text. It doesn't mean God caused this to happen to you, Romans chapter 8. What he's saying there now, even if it's in the midst of the trials, he says God can use that for our good. It doesn't mean he caused it so you can have good. He says, no, in the midst of your trials and your tribulation and crisis and drama, the child of God can praise him. The child of God can have hope because we have hope. We have an anchor that is firm. Is your anchor firm in Jesus and in Christ alone? That no matter what's happening, that's the kind of people who will make it through in the end of time. Not those who are easily, you know, sh um, shaken off. A little thing happened to you, you're ready to give up, you know. Pastor Duncan, what's that thing you always say? I love it too. When you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot, and do what? You're not just tie the knot. You say, hang on. It's at the end of the rope, but tie that knot there and say, Lord, I am holding on. We're going through this. If you want me to climb up the mountain, give me the strength. But if I don't have the strength, Lord, take me through the mountain if I got to. Be encouraged. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. But David encouraged himself. Ezra chapter 7 verse 28 also. Uh, Ezra is saying, so I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. Amen. Ezra, you got to encourage yourself. By the way, many of you type in that word just encourage or encouragement. Listen, right here. I got three. I'm not going to read them, of course. But I got three pages of Bible text. I just type in the word encourage. Three pages, right? And if I use the derivatives of it, you'll find more. But don't tell me if God has three pages of text on encouragement, he takes it seriously. Can you find encouragement in the Lord? Yes, maybe you need to go to the word and read the encouragement that he has already for you. Encourage yourself in the Lord. And we know sometimes you might stay in the trial, but you can still have faith. But at what, this is what we love, so I got to end on a positive. Because David did something interesting. By, by the way, remember, he didn't need his men to encourage him. His men were actually discouraging him. Those closest to you can be the one who discourage you the most. And that's why I'm appealing to us. When our church members are suffering, do not add to their suffering by further discouraging them. We don't want to do that. That's the work of the enemy. We need encouragement. So here's what David did now. So David said to Abiathar the priest, Abimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought 
thing the ephod to David, and David did what, everybody? He inquired of the Lord, and he asked the Lord, shall I, imagine a man asking God now to go and go and take some action. He didn't tell God, Lord, shall I just go and just, you know, bargain, negotiate with them now. David said, let me, Lord, I know, I know this is why when we have, we're going to have some discussion, and we need to have some serious discussion, because, you know, when it comes to these issues of what's happening with violence, we, we normally want to be the meek and mild one, okay? But we got to take all the scriptures into consideration before we draw that conclusion. I'm not saying the other way, whatever your persuasion is, but here the man of God is saying, listen, you took my wife. You took my son. It ain't going down just like that. <laughs> It's not, you see, I know, I, I know you've been spiritualized with the preaching over the years, but I beg to differ on some of these things that come from our pulpit. Because when I read that scripture, David wasn't just asking God, you know, am I going to get them back? He said, shall I go and pursue them? Shall I take my boys and go handle business, in other words? And guess what he did? He went and he handled business. And it was not a, just a confrontation in let's negotiate and let's talk. No, no, no. They had a struggle. They had a fight. They drew their sword. They took action. You can weep about it all you want. You can pray about it all you want. You can even encourage yourself all you want. But Sister Martha, sometimes you got to also take action. See, the video tells us we can run, we can hide, but somebody got to also be the sheepdog. See, many of our situations can be solved, but you see, that's what I'm saying. We're looking for heaven to open up and the angels to come down and do the fighting for us. No. You see, when you land on your back, you might look up and ask God, but you better get up. He's going to encourage you. But you can't stay on your back because you can't win the battle from your back. You see, we look up because we need the encouragement because we're falling. But when you're falling, you got to get up and get back in the game. Round two, round three, round four. You might even whoop me in all rounds, but the last round, I can knock you out. And I still win. Ha! Huh. Isn't that interesting? So you give up before the match ends. Because you've been being whooped in all other rounds, and you said, I said, let me, I'm, hey, you know what, listen, hey, call the fight off. Listen, you never know. It's, God is waiting for that last round to give the devil that full uppercut that's going to knock him out. And many of us are not waiting on the Lord to help us with that because we think that he's, no, God wants to give the devil a black eye, but he wants to use you to do it. Because he already did it on the cross. So he's saying, I want you to experience what I experience. The devil has no power over the child of God. He says, listen, man, no demon in hell can prevail against my church. I know that. Do you know that? So yes, the sickness come upon you. Rejoice in me anyhow. Do what I tell you to do, and the devil will not have dominion over you. Your marriage might be going down, but you start acting the way I tell you to act and watch how you can turn your spouse around. Because if you be loving and kind and gentle like I told you to do, she's going to change and the devil will be shocked and surprised. He can't throw nothing else. Poverty stricken and yet you are being provided for. What is this? Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep on holding on. But let us do know that, yes, I want you to weep when it's time to weep. I want you to cry when it's time to cry. I want you to call upon God when it's time to call upon the Lord. But I want you to take action when it's time to take action. We play offense and defense. But the reality is too long the church has been playing defense. Because here's the thing. When you look at the arm of God, there ain't nothing for the back. Go back and read Ephesians 6. There's nothing for the back. Why? God got your back. Face the battle. Face the enemy. I give you the protective covering for the front. But when it comes to, because guess what? He didn't want you to retreat. Because if you retreat, now your back is exposed. So he said, I'm not giving them anything for the back. Because if you want to run here, yeah, he's going to put some darts and arrows in your back. So 
This is how God wants us. Forward ever. They said backward never. Forward ever. My people are going forward. The church is not in the defensive posture. He says the gates of, you know, we take that out of context. The gates of hell, think about this. He says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. You know, we think that means that the gates of hell is constantly trying to overtake God's church. Let me ask you a question. It says the gates of hell. So where are the gates? By the church or by hell? Amen? So who's the one storming the gates? But so long we've been thinking, oh, let's protect the church, let's make sure, that, and we, we, we're playing defense like if the gates were here, and so we're just trying to protect the turf here. No. He says the gates of hell will not prevail. The advancing troop is God's church. That is storming the gates of hell. And he said that gate is going to fall. It cannot prevail because we're coming to take our people out of it. You and I, we just sit down and let the enemy beat us up. And we say we're meek and mild. Forget meek and mild. Right? Meek and mild is character trait. Meek and mild don't mean you sit down, lay over, roll over, and the enemy just kicking us and beating us. And every time we come and give a testimony, nobody got a testimony. Every, everybody's testimony is the devil whooping me. Think about it. Most of our testimony is what the devil is doing to us. I ain't got no job. I ain't got no this. My car broke down. My this is happening. My children and this. And that's all we say week after week. Where the testimony. No, this week everything went well. I praise the Lord. This week I had no problems. This week I succeeded. This week my business went well. This week my husband recovered. This week this happened. We got to say this, these are the encouraging things because if you come to the gates of the church every week telling us about the drama, how you defeated, ain't nobody want to go out there. You don't put fear in us. If the devil is doing all of this in our midst, then I'm afraid to go out there. Stop putting fear in us. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, self-discipline. How about today? I'm encouraging the church to be strong, to encourage yourself in God. I'm encouraging us not to play the weakling this week. I'm encouraging us to take action on whatever God has been telling you. Take some action. Try it. Step out in faith. Do something about your situation. Don't just, we weeping days are over. We don't wept long enough. We don't pray it long enough. It's time to go and act. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we want to thank you. It's not easy living in this world, God. Our hearts indeed can get fearful as we see the events of the signs of the times. Violence everywhere in the church, outside the church. People are not respecting your sanctuary anymore. The sanctuary is being laid desolate. But, oh God, we want to thank you this morning because like David, yes, we can find encouragement in the Lord. We have wept, oh God, based on our tragedies and, and, and tribulations that we've experienced this past week. But as we prepare to close out this week, we are asking you to renew our strength like you renewed David. Because the Bible didn't say David found strength in himself. He found his strength in the Lord. God, encourage us. And we also pray for this week, Lord. You will help us to put on our spiritual boxing gloves and get in the fight of life. That you will give us the courage, the boldness that we need because we have been given that boldness. You even said, come to the throne of grace boldly. So help us to be bold this week and take action. Let us not be afraid. Many of us have been afflicted in our health. God, let us not be afraid. Let us not give in. Let us not give up. Many of us are having financial difficulties. Let us not give in. Let us not give up. Many of us are having family problems and all manner of tribulations are affecting your people. And Lord, if we cannot contend with these child tra challenges that we are facing, how shall we endure in the end when the horsemen come with more problems? You got to rise us up, Lord. Raise us up. Raise up your people to be bold and tenacious. Raise up your people to pray and to weep, but to do more than that, to take action because we need living, active faith that will save us in the last days. Bless us and strengthen us. If anybody in this sanctuary today is encouraged, I ask, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit may minister encouragement to them. Let none of us leave here hopeless, depressed, discouraged, in in distress, but let us leave encouraged, joyful, believing 
that indeed, because of Christ, we can do all things. In Jesus' name, amen.